date, starting on time, always good. Um, I did make up a new attendance sheet for today, and I printed it out, but I did not grab it off the printer. So this is the one from yesterday. Um, if you're in the first column, there is a blank column, so just put your initials there. If you're in the second column, just initial down the side, and we'll make that work for today. Okay. Um, if you did not get your name on the seating chart and were not here yesterday, please make sure to either raise your hand now or come down after class and get on the seating chart. Okay. Um, so sign in for attendance. Monday's a holiday. So I kind of decided this week, since Monday's a holiday, might as well give you an extra day for homework and quiz. Okay, that's not the norm. Normally, homework is due Saturday, quiz is due Sunday. That kind of wraps up the week for us. So it's kind of your way to show that you've learned that material for that week. Okay, so the homework due this weekend is chapters one and two. That's kind of where we are. We are into chapter three now. We'll push that off to next week. But it pretty much gives you a feel. You know, are, have you learned the material? Are you ready to move on to the stuff for the following week? Okay. Take the time. Take advantage of the quizzes. Okay. There are three versions. They are very similar. Um, but the numbers are changed. The order of questions is rearranged. So at least it makes you think about it a little bit. Okay, so take advantage of those three opportunities. This one cracks me up. Not that they all don't, but ho, ho, ho. Water joke? Oh, H2O kind of written differently. Uh, okay, if you have to explain the jokes, then they're not funny, I guess. I don't know. Question? I was wondering if the dates are the Not yet. Okay. I just thought about it this morning as I was preparing for class, and I just didn't have time to go in. But I, after class, I'll go in and I'll change the dates and achieve. Remind me if I don't, but that's the plan. Yes. Oh, I th oh, I didn't put this current pre-lecture. I did forgot about that. I think the homework and quiz are there, or are they not? Okay. Re keep reminding me, because I have to actually, you know, I don't get into BB Learn that often, as you've seen. I've been putting the links to the lecture videos there, but that's about it. So I just need to be reminded to get in and mess with the calendar there. Okay. All right. If, if, I, if I keep forgetting, keep prodding me, and because um, and I'd be happy to do it. It's just that I have to make sure to think about it, because I, I don't do that very often. OK, I'll try to do that for you. Um, so before we start, let's look at BB Learn and Achieve very quickly. Um, as I just kind of mentioned, I don't use BB Learn that much for this course. Um, links into Achiever there, the syllabus is there, and it's just easier for me to put the links to the lecture recordings there rather than to put them in Achieve because that'll, they'll just clutter up Achieve. There's already a lot of stuff there for you to deal with. So I want to leave Achieve to be your assignments, the readings, things like that. So the lecture recordings will all be here in the Blackboard course. Oh, I always forget I have to switch to wireless here. I don't know why it doesn't. I had it checked before. All right, let's, uh, well, this, let's go to this one. It's not going to be, we'll come back. Um, this is my view, um, but make sure when you're in Achieve, it's just easier to navigate if you're in Assignments view. So at the very top, you can switch views. That's the best view to be in. And let me go to your student view. I'm assuming, oh, good. Okay. So it starts out with all the things that are due this week. Okay. Now, the unfortunate thing about Achieve is that their week is Sunday through Saturday. I would rather it be Monday through Sunday 
but that's not the case. So your homework, which is due Saturday, well, it's going to change now. So this is going to actually get pushed into next week. Right now, it's due Saturday, so it shows up this week. But your quiz is Sunday, which shows up in the next week's assignment. So make sure you realize that. So next week, at least right now, you have your three versions of the quiz. Okay, and that's Sunday. That's the start of next week. Um, some of you have worked on this adaptive quiz. That's just for practice. It's not required. But it's kind of a neat feature because it will give you all sorts of problems. Do you, do you like it? Yeah. Okay. It gives you all sorts of problems. And then if you struggle on a certain topic, it will give you more problems. And then it will make recommendations at the end that you kind of need to go back and study sig figs. Or you, gotta, you need to go back and work on your unit conversions or things like that. They have those for most chapters, so I will tend, you know, I'll post chapter three soon, and, you know, I'll try to kind of post them with the quizzes, and then you can decide if, if you want to do them or not. Um, but I think they're kind of helpful, at least to kind of show you where you are. Yes? Well, I don't think so, but you can always jump back in and just keep going. There's no limit to how long you can be in there. Like if I were to assign them, you have to get to a certain number, like 600 or something. Um, but you can keep working past that. So feel free to spend as much time as you want. OK, so that's Achieve. Um, you can always, somewhere down here, there are your past assignments. Remember those assignments. You can do the homework and the quizzes late, but you do lose 5% per day. And so don't wait too long if you're going to do those late. All right, let me see if I can get back into, oh, great. Oh, it let me back in without logging in. How about that? Um, so the lecture recordings, make sure you know they're, I'm trying to record every day. It's been working pretty well. Um, I do post the latest one at the top so you don't have to scroll all the way down. I think that's probably better. I don't know. So they're in reverse order, but those are starting from so at some point last week. So you might, if there's a certain topic that you're struggling with, go back and go back through that. All right. A little bit of stuff before class starts. Any questions on what's coming up? All right. So let me remind you where we left off. This is, we are now into chapter three. Okay, we're actually getting into some chemistry. Kind of took a detour into some, you know, into a math course for a while and we've come back to reality. Um, so the concept of the atom the concept of the atom. That was proposed 2,500 years ago, okay? I find that kind of amazing, you know, that just having really no evidence that there were atoms, no scientific evidence, somebody, you know, is thinking that deeply about what makes things up to say there must be some, something that's the smallest indivisible particle of matter. Okay. Now, that's not quite right, but for 2,500 years ago, that's really forward thinking. Chemistry kind of went into the dark ages for a while. Um, not until about the 1600s into the 1700s did real chemistry experimentation start going on, and we went through some of those experiments yesterday. And then we left off with Lavoisier, who was really considered the father of modern chemistry. Um, really brought it into an experimental science, and he pulled all the experiments, not all the experiments, but a lot of the experiments from the 16 and 1700s into uh, developing the law of conservation of mass, which is huge for chemistry. Okay, it's a huge concept that we run a reaction, we start with reactants, things happen, bonds break, new bonds form, things change, but the mass of what we get is the same. Okay, matter is neither created nor destroyed. That's, that's huge. And so, law of conservation of mass, so make sure you notice. And as I pointed out yesterday, I love this reaction because it's like, 
taking highly reactive sodium. If you put that in your mouth, don't do it. Um, don't try this at home. Um, it, would not be, it would not be good for you. It could kill you. Um, chlorine, same way, toxic gas. But when things are rearranged, we get something that tastes quite good. You know, for those of us who put too much salt on our food, um, you kind of know the idea. So, um, fun stuff. Um, here's another example from your book. Um, this is the combustion of methane. Um, we do it, one of our chemistry professors from Australia, and methane in Australia is methane, which I kind of like, kind of sounds cool, methane. Um, so 16 grams react with 64 grams of oxygen, and we get 36 grams of water. Do a quick calculation for me. How much carbon dioxide must we get in that reaction? Punch into your calculator really quickly. You should be able to calculate the mass of carbon dioxide. Law of conservation of mass. Or you could, yeah, this one, the numbers are easy enough. You probably could do this in your head. Mass of carbon dioxide? 44. Okay, so 80 grams of reactant. We're going to get 80 grams of product. And again, what we're assuming here is that this reaction goes to completion. At the end of the semester, we'll talk about something called equilibrium, where that's complete reactions is not necessarily a given. But combustion reactions pretty much do go to completion. Okay. Particularly something like methane gas where, you know, yes, you might have a little bit of a side reaction and get a little carbon monoxide, but for the most part, they go to completion. And so 80 grams of reactant, we're going to get 80 grams of product. All right. So conservation of mass. Um, this is the early 1800s. This guy's name is John Dalton. He is actually an English school teacher. He was not an experimental scientist, but he read a lot of scientific papers, read the work of Lavoisier and others before him, and he was really to first to put together a unified atomic theory. Okay, so you're going to see stuff here that you're going to know, but in the early 1800s, this was really new and pulling a lot of um, chemical research together into a unifying theory. Okay, so here's just kind of restating that elements are made of tiny indivisible particles called atoms. Okay, and we, that had been proposed, but it had not really been developed. Um, this is kind of work, we talked about the work of Sennert where he separated silver from gold um, to kind of show those were unique from each other. They were different, um, different types of atoms. So the atoms of each element are unique. They're different from each other. Atoms can combine to form compounds. Okay, we know this stuff, but again, this is like 1808. It's all being pulled together into unifying theory. Um, the other cool thing here to note is this whole number ratio. Okay, they're always going to combine in some whole number ratio. Think about water. It's always two hydrogens for every one oxygen. Carbon dioxide, one carbon for every two oxygens. Okay, it doesn't have to be two to one, but it has some whole number ratio. And then this kind of gets to matter is neither created nor destroyed. Okay, um, atoms are unchanged in the chemical reactions. Okay, so if we start with oxygen as a reactant, as an atom in some compound or as a pure element, we still have oxygen atoms on the product side as well. Okay, so that's kind of pulling a lot of stuff together. Now, it's amazing what you can find on the interwebs. You know, if you go out there and search, I went and found one of Dalton's very first papers on this, just because I'm a science guy, right? And so, um, so I read through Dalton's paper, and the top up there is how he represented atoms and um, compounds, okay? 
So that top drawing, and I just clipped those out of his paper, if I can get this to work. The one that was kind of shaded in, that circle, was carbon. The one that was unshaded was oxygen. Then he showed, essentially, a bond to form carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So way back in the early 1800s, that's how he's representing his atoms and molecules. And the modern representations aren't that different. Um, they give you a little bit more three-dimensional view and a little bit more view where the electrons are spreading out around the nuclei, but you can kind of see the similarities in terms of how we draw out structures. So anyway, thought that was kind of cool. And so here um, is a similar reaction um, for those of us who like to barbecue. Um, using charcoal rather than um, propane. Um, so we have our charcoal briquette, mostly carbon, and combine that with oxygen uh, to produce carbon dioxide. And there will also be, um, well, actually, in this case, there's no hydrogen in there. So carbon and oxygen to produce carbon dioxide also produce a lot of heat. So there's a representation there. But note a couple of things here. Carbon on the left we end up with carbon on the right. Oxygen on the left, oxygen on the right. Okay, so nothing in terms of the atoms has changed. Um, we will find out as we start digging into elements, yes, they are different. Carbon is different from oxygen. And in a chemical reaction, things are rearranged. And compounds have a whole number ratio, carbon dioxide, one carbon for every two oxygens. So all of that is kind of contained in that reaction. So let's restate. This is just kind of restating some of the stuff we know. All matter is composed of atoms. Atoms of each element are unique, having different um, properties and characteristics. Okay, in chemical reactions, atoms are not changed, but combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. Okay. So probably knew a lot of that stuff if you've had a chemistry course before, but it's kind of nice just to restate that. All right, can we see atoms? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? So we talked, and we're going to come back to that problem that, we, that I handed out the very first day, where we talked about an atomic force microscope. Um, developed shortly before the atomic force microscope was a scanning tunneling microscope. Okay? And... There was a scientist, I don't know if he's still there, but this is back in the 80s, 1980s. He developed the first low temperature scanning tunneling microscope. And by low temperature, we're talking really low temperature. He would put the instrument not directly in the liquid helium, but above, he would have what's, what's called a dewer, which is a, basically a, a really good thermo, or good, uh, well, I'm blanking on the term. Uh, anyway, it, it keeps the substance really cool. So he has liquid helium, and then the instrument's above that in the helium vapor, so it's at helium temperature. Does anybody know the temperature of liquid helium? Just random, bizarre fact. Temperature of liquid helium. Four point two Kelvin. Four point two Kelvin. Okay, so four degrees above absolute zero. About a you know, we can actually get colder with liquid helium refrigerators. There's actually things that exist in science, um, but almost at absolute zero. So essentially, the motion of atoms ceases at that temperature. So this guy, and this was, you know, just kind of for fun, but he worked for one of the IBM research labs. And one of the very first things he did with his low temperature STM, because the atoms were essentially not moving at that temperature, he could actually pick up individual atoms and move them. 
you, you're not amazed, but it's amazing that you could actually pick up individual atoms and move them on a surface where you wanted to put them. So since he worked for IBM, spelled out IBM. Why not if you can do it? With individual atoms. Okay, so this is a scanning, this is a representation of a scanning tunneling microscope. Um, you don't need to know this, but it's kind of cool stuff. Um, the gold looking uh, array of atoms at the top is to represent the tip of the scanning tunneling microscope. The purple ish atoms at the bottom are the surface of interest. Okay, the scanning tunneling microscope, it does have to be a conductive surface as opposed to the atomic force that we talked about where essentially a tip and the surface kind of repel each other. Um, so it doesn't have to be conductive. And what's really cool, and we're gonna get into electrons because electrons don't behave like we think they should because um, they're not real world particles. But the electrons, we say they tunnel across this gap, okay? So what do we mean by tunnel across the gap? Well, at some moment in time, the electron or electrons are in the tip that are gonna move across, and at the next moment, they're at the surface, and they did not exist in between that gap. Okay, did everybody hear that? So they were at the tip, they come across to the surface, but they, did ne they never existed in between the gap between those. Okay, and that is what is characteristic of a quantum particle in terms of it can exist at certain locations and not others. And that's not how we think of a normal real world particle. So we'll talk more about that later. But anyway, this, um, you s figure out, uh, you set a current across here, very sensitive to distance as you scan that tip across the surface. Um, you can maintain a constant tunneling current as it moves. So as there's more, ele more electrons in a certain region of the surface, the tip will move further away to maintain the same current. And if there's fewer electrons, the tip will move closer. And essentially you map out the electron density of the surface. And essentially we see, and air quotes, right? We don't you know, see them with our eyes, but we see atoms in terms of where the electrons are in the atoms. Anyway, pretty cool stuff. Um, here's some other things that scientists um, at um, I IBM um, did early on. Um, this is one metal on top of another metal surface. So actually depositing um, different metals on other metals and seeing the structures that are there. Um, just for funny, I also spelled out, I, at least the book this came from said these were Japanese characters that roughly translate to Adam. I don't know if that's true. Um, and then one more technique um, in terms of structure, um, X-ray crystallography. We can actually take a, a crystal of a solid, hit it with X-rays. Those X-rays will diffract off the atoms. And in the old days, they would have you know, x-ray film and they would see spots of where the x-rays would come off and hit. In the old days, they would get out their rulers and you know, you know, measure the angles and the distances and whatever. And it was a lot of work to try to figure out the structure of the molecule. Okay? For quite a while now, it's all been computerized. The computer does all the work. Uh, but we can figure out the structure of molecules um, quite accurately. Um, this is one of my favorite molecules. This is caffeine, okay? Don't go a day without it. Um, but anyway, if you could count through here, um, again, general colors, make sure you kind of pick up some of the general colors for the elements. Um, kind of a dark gray or black is carbon. Um, kind of a white or um, grayish, light gray, hydrogen, and oxygen in red. So if we count all those up, what do we get? How many carbons do you see? Okay, I heard nine, C9. How many hydrogens? 
There's one kind of hidden, so be careful. Yeah, there's one you can't, you can kind of see it peeking out. I can't reach up that high, but back there. So there's, on that one carbon, there's actually three hydrogens, and then four, five, six, seven, and then one on the oxygen at the top. And how many oxygens? Four. Okay. So that is caffeine. All right, and so your pre-lecture for today. How many of you are pretty familiar with the periodic table? Okay, quite a few, some, okay. Um, you know, it is a tool for us. Oh, and let me do this before I forget. I did photocopy a periodic table for you to have. So let me hand these out, if I can. There we go. So I will always give you a periodic table on every exam, um, so you don't have to memorize stuff. This is really a tool for us to use in this course and in chemistry. No reason to memorize the entire periodic table unless you get bored and really want to. Why not? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, happy Chem Friday, by the way. Yeah. This week seems seemed to go by really fast since we didn't meet on Monday. It just seems like it's not the end of our week yet. But maybe that's a good, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know if that's enough, but hopefully. How are you guys doing back here? Good. Uh, sometimes. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Hopefully, did I get enough periodic tables around the room? Everybody have one? Okay. Um, so this is, to, I, I kind of like this table. It's not quite up to date. It doesn't have all the brand new elements at the bottom. There's a few extras. That's okay. Don't worry about those anyway. Um, this actually I printed out from a university in England. Where did this come from, does it say? Don't know. But anyway, I like this one. But of course, it was from a university in England, so it has the Eng English, you know, proper English from England um, of some of the elements. So you'll notice, look at sulfur that's spelled with a PH and not an, like we spell it with an F. Don't worry about that too much. Um, the one I like is aluminium. In the rest of the world, it's not aluminum, it's aluminium. And the story that I've heard about that is that Alcoa, Alcoa Aluminum, decided they liked aluminum better than aluminum, so they just changed the name. And because they're a big aluminum manufacturer here in the US, that's, it became aluminum and not aluminum. Um, let's see what's other ones. I don't know if there's any others that are spelled kind of funky because of the English spelling. I don't know. But anyway, names are there. You don't have to memorize the names, although you will learn a lot of them over the course of the, of the semester. And then every layout of a tab periodic table is a little bit different in terms of where they put the atomic number, the average atomic mass, and whatnot. So I want you to get used to this table because this is the one you'll see on an exam. Okay, so we'll talk about atomic number, average atomic mass, all that stuff as we go on. Okay? Any questions before we get back to the notes? All right. Kind of looking at mid-1800s, uh, Mendeleev is a Russian, um, and he starts noticing similarities between certain elements. And he initially 
kind of puts them all, let's think of it as postcards. He makes a card for each element and he starts sorting them out and trying to arrange things by property, okay? Oh, well, we know that fluorine symbol of chlorine, let's put them in the same column or the same row. He, you know, initially he didn't arrange them in columns, but he would try to arrange them and figure out if there was some reason why things had similar properties. And so these are, and you should know the names of certain groups of the table. This is a very common one. These are the halogens. Um, it is in the old scheme. So look at one of these tables over here, or you can look at the one that you just got. Let me grab a copy of that so I can see this. For years and years and years, that was group 7A. Okay, so you'll, I will still refer to them as being in group 7. Um, there was another numbering scheme that wasn't competing with that one. So then the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Yes, such a thing exists. The International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, IUPAC, decided, well, let's just come up with a simplified scheme and now they're just numbered one through 18, which is kind of boring because um, the seven actually will mean something to us as we go on. So halogens are group seven or group 17. They have similar properties. That's why they're in the same column. One thing that's kind of interesting about these that you might notice, um, fluorine and chlorine are actually gases at room temperature. Now, if you look at bromine and iodine, iodine, it's, it, should, it should be iodine, right? Because it's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, but we typically say iodine. Um, you will notice there's gas in there. But bromine is actually a liquid at room temperature. Quite a carcinogenic liquid as well. Um, and, but the forces that hold the bromine molecules together are quite weak. And even at room temperature, it, it vaporizes very readily. Okay, it goes from the liquid into the gas phase. Bromine happily, happens to have this kind of cool red-brown color. And so you can actually see the vapor. You can see the gas phase, okay? Iodine, if you notice at the very bottom here, you might not notice that, it's actually a solid at room temperature. It's a solid at room temperature. Again, the forces, and we'll talk about this later in the course, why are the forces so weak between iodine molecules and bromine molecules? We'll get there. Forces are weak, and so iodine goes straight from the solid into the gas phase at room temperature. And iodine is purple, one of my favorite colors, and you can see the gas phase up above. Does anybody know what it's called when a solid goes directly from solid to gas phase without going through the liquid phase? So iodine, which exists as a diatomic molecule, goes straight to the gas phase at room temperature, doesn't go through a liquid phase. What do we call that? I know some of you have heard it, heard this. Have you heard that term before? Yeah. So that phase change is called sublimation, straight from solid to gas. Another common substance where you see that is dry ice. If anybody's had the fun of playing with dry ice, which is solid CO2. Solid CO2 goes directly from solid to gas at room temperature and pressure. Okay, so that's Mendeleev. Um, here's more of a modern periodic table. You have one of these. A um, couple things to note there, as you probably saw in the pre-lecture, we'll go through this very quickly. Most of the periodic table is metals. Okay, so those are the ones kind of shown in that lilac color maybe or light gray. Um, Nonmetals are all on the upper right, except for hydrogen. Okay, make a note of hydrogen. Hydrogen does not fit anywhere on the periodic table. Poor hydrogen. Oh, don't feel too sad for hydrogen. Um, but hydrogen gets stuck over in the first column. Um, it is not 
an alkali metal. Okay, so that first column, those are called the alkali metals, but it just gets stuck over there because there's really no, it, it, similar in terms of the number of outer electrons, but other than that, it's not similar at all. Yeah. What about them? Yeah, I'm guessing they probably don't know enough about those yet to determine their properties. All of these here, and you'll see these, you know, in parentheses, those are all man-made. And they're all radioactive. They all have very short half-lives. They're all made in very low quantities. So they're, there's not that much known about them other than essentially knowing how many protons they have. And assuming they're going to have properties periodic to the ones above them. But, you know, until we actually maybe hit a region where we make, can make stable elements, then we might be able to figure out a little bit more about properties. Um, there are elements in between the metals and nonmetals that are called metalloids or semimetals. Their properties are in between. They're probably a little bit closer to nonmetals than metals, but they're kind of um, listed as distinct because they're not, they're not metals, they're not nonmetals, they're kind of in between. Um, silicon is probably the one you're most familiar with um, of those metalloids. Okay, so periodic, we're gonna, there's going to be going across a row and going down a column, kind of like a calendar. So just terminology that you should know, the periods are the rows. Okay, so periodic table. Um, periods are the rows. The columns we call groups or families. And those are the ones, they are grouped in the same column because they have similar chemical properties. Okay. And quite often similar physical properties, but not always. Okay, so periods and groups or families, make sure you know that. Um, you will notice that there's some symbols that may not make sense, sodium, is Na. The reason for that is, of course, you know, when these are being developed, you know, Mendeleev and others, um, they went and used a lot of Latin names for the elements, so natrium for sodium, Na. Iron is ferrum, Fe. Copper is cuprum, so Cu. And lead is plumbum, so Pb. So a lot of the symbols um, you're going to just have to get used to as far as kind of not making sense based on the words that we use. And note that all the symbols have a capital letter, and they may have a second lowercase letter, depending on the element. All right, so the periodic table um, is arranged in a particular way, um, initially just by properties, and then now it's grouped even more um, in terms of what we're going to find out are valence electrons, outer electrons. We're not quite there yet. Um, but groups one, two, and then three through eight in the old numbering scheme, those are the main group elements, and th those are the groups we'll spend the most time with. Okay, so groups one and two on the very far left, and then three through eight on the right. Those are the main groups. That's where we're gonna spend the bulk of the semester. This middle block, we'll spend some time there as well. Those are the transition metals or the transition elements, but those are metals. So the transition metals, the least amount of time that we'll spend this semester with any of the elements is down here at the bottom. Those are the inner transition, and if you wanna break them down further, and you don't need to know these names, but just uh, in case you'd like to know, this first row, are the, those are called the lanthanides, and the second row are called the actinides. Okay, so lanthanides and actinides. But again, the bulk of our semester will be spent with the main group elements, and then some with the transition metals. 
Okay, we did metals already. Transition metals in the middle. Get a few pictures of some of those. Um, copper, gold, and iron. Hope we have some more. What do we got here? Silver. Um, and you'll notice, I mean, we know what metals look like, right? Typical, you know, they, a lot of them have a luster. Um, a lot of metals are hard, not all of them, but um, a lot of metals we can, are ductile and malleable and whatnot. The nonmetals are going to look quite different. So sulfur, even though it's a solid, looks quite different from a metal. It's a yellow powdered solid. We talked about bromine already. It's actually a liquid that vaporizes very readily. Oh, and those are just a couple examples. But the nonmetals look quite different than the metals. And then the metalloids, you know, silicon, you know, might have a little bit of luster to it, but um, you can see when it's made into the silicon wafer, it doesn't quite look like a metal. It's kind of in between. And then as far as a few groups go, you saw this in the pre-lecture, um, definitely no group one, alkali metals, Highly reactive metals, soft, low melting points. Again, similar properties. Okay, So they're all very soft. They all have low melting points. They're all quite reactive. Okay, And so soft metals react violently with water. I'll have to see if I have that reaction on my computer for you. It's always fun to watch. Um, we could always... Look on YouTube. Uh, group two, make sure you know the name of this group as well. These are the alkaline earth metals. They're not quite as soft as the alkaline metals, and they are less reactive. Um, one neat thing, you may have at some point seen magnesium burning. It burns with a very bright um, white light. Talked about the halogens already. Make sure you know the name of that group. Okay, these are all diatomic. Again, remember, periodic table is arranged because of similar chemical properties. And we'll get in further that it really has to do with how many outer electrons that atom has. So we're going to dig deeper as we go on. Um, diatomic molecules, they tend to be quite reactive, and they combine to form many different compounds. Another group that you should know are the noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon. Um, radon is another one. It's radioactive. We might talk about that later. Radon's kind of fun. So you'll see that comment there at the bottom that says they generally do not form compounds. In nature, they are inert. Okay, These used to be call, called the inert gases because they don't react. So in nature, you will not find a single noble gas compound. Don't exist. And that was actually why they were hard to discover, because they didn't combine with anything. And they were all gases. So these elements were discovered pretty late as far as the discovery of elements came. Okay? Now, in the research lab, I think starting in the 70s, maybe late 60s, the first noble gas compounds were synthesized. Okay, but high temperature, high pressure, non-conditions -con that we wouldn't have in the normal um, atmosphere and normally on Earth. Um, they all, so they generally do not form compounds. They are gases at room temperature. All right, so I've been talking for a long time. Um, let's just return to our atomic structure. Elements are unique. Atoms combine to form compounds conservation of matter. And we have about six more minutes. I might take a break here. Um, we're eventually going to go into next week, breaking it down further and get into subatomic particles. So this is kind of where Dalton you know, didn't go. This is a mistake. Not really. There was no way for him to know about electrons and protons and neutrons yet. Okay, So that's coming. Those experiments 
to uncover subatomic particles started more toward the late 1800s, so we'll get there. And let me see, just for fun, since we're, I've been talking for a long time. I meant to look for this this morning. I usually have a video on my computer. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Where'd it go? All right, so this would be a good way to wrap up the week. Okay, so thanks for hanging with me today. That was a lot of, a lot of lecture notes. So again, a good way to wrap up here in terms of periodic properties. So what we're going to see in this video is these are the alkali metals. So since they're in the same group or family, we expect them to have the similar reactivities. We expect them to... Um, in a lot of cases to have similar, similar physical properties, but the most important thing is similar reactivity. So we're going to look at two reactions, the reactions of that metal. So M here is the metal, the alkali metal, with oxygen. That reaction is not as exciting, but then we're going to look at the reaction with water. That one's a little bit more exciting. So let's watch this. There are six alkali metals, lithium, sodium, Potassium, rubidium, oh, come on. cesium, and francium. They're all soft metals which can be cut with a knife. In air, the elements quickly become coated with compounds that form on the metal surface. Here, for example, is lithium. When we slice it, you can see the metallic luster, but the black coating quickly reappears. So that's lithium reacting with oxygen to form lithium oxide, and it happens quite quickly, as you can see. Sodium is kept under oil to prevent reaction with air. Again, when we cut it, the metal surface can be seen. But this time, corrosion occurs even more quickly. With the next alkali metal, potassium, the corrosion in air is so quick that it's hard to see the metallic luster at all. As we go down the group, the elements seem to react more quickly with air. Now let's see another reaction of the alkali metals, the reaction with water. We'll start with lithium. The metal floats on the water and reacts with it, giving up hydrogen gas. Now for sodium. The same sort of thing happens, although the reaction is a bit more vigorous. All the alkali metals react with water in the same way. Let's see an equation for the reaction. Hydrogen gas is produced, and the metal dissolves to give an aqueous cation with a single positive charge. Okay, so just to ask you a question before we wrap this up. Hydrogen gas is produced. So what do you think might happen in some of these reactions as things get more reactive? Yeah, fire or even better. Um, but hydrogen's highly combustible. Now for potassium. This time you'll see a flame. The heat given out by the reaction is produced so quickly that the hydrogen gas catches fire. It burns with a lilac flame. The next element is rubidium. This time we put a safety screen between us and the reaction. You can see that things gradually become more terrifying as we go down the group. Did everybody hear that? Gradually become more terrifying as we go down the group. You gotta love that. Okay, get ready for this one. Let's try cesium, our fifth alkali metal. Oh, we, we gotta see that again. As we go down the group. Let's try cesium. Our fifth alkali metal. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Um, so, a couple of things. 
Similar properties, that's very important. Quite often similar physical properties are all soft metals, low uh, melting points. More reactive as we go down the group. We'll talk about why that's the case as we go on the course. Um, and one thing to wrap up with today, cesium. So they all have low melting points. The melting point of cesium is only about 30 Celsius. Does anybody know what body temperature is in Celsius? Yeah, typically, that's a little bit higher. Yeah, yeah, it's around 37, but you're, you're close, so 37 Celsius. I did get one chance in my chemistry career to play with some cesium, but you don't want to touch it because it will react with the moisture in your hand, so I didn't get to really play with it, but it was in a sealed um, glass ampule under probably nitrogen or argon gas. But it was it's beautiful gold flaky metal, goldish flaky metal, and you hold that tube in your hand and it melts. The cesium melts, not the tube. The cesium melts in your hand. Don't put it in your mouth, not in your mouth. Um, but uh, the cesium would melt, then you take the tube out of your hand and it would just recrystallize, re-solidify, just like that. It was really cool. It was really fun. I sat there for about 10 minutes just melting it, letting it solidify, melting it, letting it solidify. I could have done that all day probably, but anyway. All right. Well, have a wonderful weekend since I won't see you tomorrow. Um, don't forget about the homework and quiz. Enjoy the long weekend. We don't get many of those. If you have questions, please come on down and help you out. Seating chart, yes. Um, where are